Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this uh, second day of the Interparliamentary Conference for the Common Foreign and Security Policy and the Common Security and Defense Policy here in Sofia. Um, we are starting this panel, which uh, um, is at the heart, I think, of uh, Bulgaria's uh, aspirations during the six months of, uh, of its presidency. Because uh, no matter what we do, whether we talk about accession perspective or connectivity, about the Berlin process, or just about our relations with our neighbors, at the end of the day, it's about accelerating reforms, and uh, it's about uh, fostering um, not only stability, but also development in the region of the Western Balkans. And therefore, it is my pleasure to open this panel um, this morning. We're going to have the Bulgarian Foreign Minister, Katerina Zakharyeva, who, however, will have to leave at quarter past 10. So we will try to, to do uh, as much uh, of uh, the discussion while she's here as possible. Um, we have Mr. Edward Kukan from the European Parliament. Um, and we have uh, Mr. Thomas Mayer-Harting uh, from uh, the External Action Service. Unfortunately, my colleague Gerald Knaus is ill, so we're going to, um, to have the uh, kind of more analytical and or civil society uh, perspective uh, mostly from, uh, from the floor. With this, um, I'm going to give uh, the floor to Ms. Zaharieva, reminding everybody that um, the speeches of the, uh, of the presenters should be um, uh, less than 10 minutes, and then the speaking time of, uh, within the discussion should be not uh, more than two minutes. And uh, I hope um, that we're going to go um, into more depth about how we can indeed be of help uh, to our neighbors in the Western Balkans. Mrs. Zaharyev. Thank you, Vesela. Good morning to everybody. And now uh, I'll continue in Bulgarian language because we're in Bulgarian. Yesterday uh, I spoke only English and today I prefer to turn on Bulgarian. Please put on your... Yeah, thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to all of you. I wish to thank uh, the Bulgarian Parliament for having organized the traditional for the presidencies, this forum, which is of extreme importance, because without the support of the parliaments of the member states and without the support of the European Parliament, I believe uh, the major priority of the Bulgarian presidency won't be full. Frederica mentioned yesterday that this is also a major prerogative for the European Commission, the prospect of the Western Balkan countries to join the European Union. So, to summarize, I'm very pleased to be here and I wish to know what you think on this extremely important issue and what your expectations are on the reforms in the Western Balkans, uh, what would be your requirements to the Council and to the Commission. I shall try to be as brief as possible and take less than 10 minutes because, as Vesela aptly reminded us at the beginning of her introductory remarks, uh, we do not have much time, but we have an important thing to discuss, and this is how to enhance the reforms on the Western Balkans, because reforms, at least I think so, have one goal, to help and support the citizens of the West uh, Balkan nations, uh, uh, thus enhancing their European prospect itself. And I believe we should focus on achieving better life, um, rule of law, working institutions, creating new jobs for the young, young people, 
basically improving the life of the societies of these nations. And yesterday, when we discussed the um, issues of defense and security with the representatives of these people, we tried to find out how we could be most useful. Prior to this, on Thursday, for the first time ever, we had the opportunity to discuss with the foreign ministers of the 28 member states the strategy that was presented to us by the European Commission on the 2nd of February by the two uh, commissioners uh, that spoke then. And I'm very much um, enthusiastic because these conversations gave me great hope. We exchanged opinions on strategy with the foreign ministers, and I believe that uh, the differences uh, between the 28 member states uh, are not that big and not insurmountable. Uh, we united in the opinion that the Western Balkans and their uh, prospect is uh, 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 an issue related to the prosperity and security of the European Union, and not only to the security and prosperity of the Western Balkan nations themselves. We also agreed that we, just as the European Union, uh, have to be ready to uh, receive them when they meet the criteria, and that they will meet the criteria, I do not doubt. So membership criteria will be met by them in a long-term and timely perspective. Uh, I remember that some of you expressed the opinion that the uh, prospect dates are a bit uh, too delayed, but uh, we all did agree that it is also motivating and uh, stimulating, and uh, I, be I firmly uh, adhere to this belief. What is important is that we agreed on six specific flagship initiatives, initiatives that lay the foundations uh, of their path uh, to the European Union and to the, the in their European perspective. We also agreed that very soon we to map out uh, specific initiatives resources that are going to be um, put at their disposal, not only financial resources, but also humane and uh, scientific and organizational resources. Something which made me extremely glad was that um, the Western Balkan nations were given every opportunity to participate in the different uh, uh, structures of the European institutions, the non-formal councils, working groups, uh, even now, um, uh, they, uh, they have their representatives here, these six countries. So this will help them prepare and um, um, educate themselves uh, for the future membership. Uh, this and uh, another important uh, uh, moment is that they'll be learning how, uh, as to how to express their own opinion on Europe. European policies. What is also extremely important is that this strategy allows for a number of additional things, uh, uh, opposition as against uh, union, and union will be the preferred option. This union will depend on uh, the preparation and stage of preparation for their future membership. S and it will give the opportunity of those uh, lag that we used to call laggers to catch up. A very important thing was pronounced to be, and we agree with this, uh, um, a very important feature appears to be the reforms. The reforms are related to setting up an establishment of democratic working institute, fight against corruption and criminality on the one hand, and on the other hand, something equally important, preparation and development of their respective economic, uh, their respective economics to align them, make them align themselves with the future membership. Um, if we continue with the same tempo, I'm afraid we shall need uh, not more, not less of 60 years. So we need to rally our resources and uh, 
to uh, help uh, these six nations catch up with the rest of the European nations in, in the European Union. Another thing that I wish to say, and uh, then I shall go on connectivity as an issue, is that uh, corridor number eight uh, will uh, result in an increase of 6% in the um, uh, uh, GDP and will increase immensely the number of jobs that will be created. So the Bulgarian presidency has a twofold um, direction. Uh, the second uh, direction is the connectivity among the nations, uh, connectivity that will, as I said, result in creating new uh, jobs for these uh, states. But when we speak connecti of connectivity, we do not mean infrastructural connectivity alone. What we have in mind is uh, connections in uh, energy field, in uh, business, and last but not least, connections uh, between the peoples of these countries. Very often in our European Parliament and within the European Union, we are discussing the unemployment, uh, unemployment among the youth in the European member states. The data that we have, at least part of us, are lower uh, than the data pointing to unemployment among youth in the uh, Western Balkan countries. Between 55 and 65 uh, percent of unemployment concerning uh, show the data uh, for these countries uh, of the uh, Western Balkans. So the entire focus on our strategy should be on this digital connectivity, working institutions, democratic institutions, and I'm sure, as I'm sure you are sure, that this will result in a couple of years' time a much better statistics concerning the Western Balkan nations. What is also very important is that this strategy covers uh, all six countries. I'm aware that uh, there have been discussions of whether to concentrate on two of them uh, that are now negotiating their future membership or to cover all the six countries. But Bulgaria, in, in its capacity of uh, president, uh, expresses great hope that uh, everybody will agree that the strategy should be comprehensive and uh, cover all six nations in the Western Balkans. I believe I should stop here because it's more important for me to listen to what you have to say. We have expressed and confirmed our position very often and you're all aware of it. Uh, situation and the European prospect to the Western Balkans is a prospect that will benefit uh, from which not only the six countries but also the entire European Union will benefit. This will be a win-win situation and uh, applying it, adhering to it uh, will uh, increase and enhance uh, the security in the European Union. I wish to thank Vessel that she organized the first discussion alongside the permanent representative of the European Commission in Sofia. Uh, she organized it with regard to the Western Balkans. I don't want to see uh, to, to um, have our colleagues uh, from the Western Balkan nations consider that they are the backyard of the Balkans. This is not true. The Balkans, Western Balkans in particular, are one of the most beautiful spots on earth. They have everything they could wish for, and I believe they are rightful place. Whenever they decide they are ready and without allowing for compromises, they will meet the membership criteria and they will take their due place among us in the European family. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that the strategy was timely, that it was stimulating, and it, that it had also an individual approach to the um, accomplishments of each of the countries. And I think those three elements uh, are worth uh, exploring here. Um, and I will, uh, while we were uh, we were preparing for this panel, I 
I had a, a, a read at uh, the document that uh, this conference uh, agreed upon yesterday. Uh, by the way, the final document is um, to be found out there at the, at the tables uh, if you want to take a copy. It's a very interesting and comp uh, comprehensive document. Um, and I, I couldn't uh, uh, stop thinking that actually 2025 must be, um, in a way, a stimulus, but also it could be uh, a warning date. And uh, I wanted to ask Mr. Cookan whether he finds uh, this as well, whether 2025 is also a sign for the countries in the region to think, well, maybe we don't have that much time anymore uh, to go on and, uh, um, and imitate um, some of the reforms. Um, and knowing that 53% of the European citizens, according to the latest Eurobarometer, are against further enlargement right now. How do we want to square this circle? There are two circles, one in the Western Balkans and one uh, in our own societies. Uh, thank you very much, distinguished participants of this important conference. Dobro uh, utro. Rad vam se. Good morning. I'm happy to be here in Sofia. Congratulations for the uh, for organizing this conference. It's my utmost pleasure to be here today speaking about the European perspective for the Western Balkans in Bulgaria, the country who gave the name to the ge to this geographic area. As someone who has been working in this region for the past two decades, I promised myself to make it to the Botev peak in one po point in the future, probably or hopefully with the help of Solomon Passi, the great experts in climbing. But jokes aside, Madam Minister, I would like to first, uh, I will speak about the date uh, in, the, in the end, wholeheartedly wish you all the success uh, in the months of your first historical Bulgarian presidency. It's a really unique opportunity for your country to showcase its leadership. Your focus on the Western Balkans, which I'm sure will be followed by the Austrian and Romanian presidencies, is much appreciated by my political group, European People's Party, and I can assure you that you have our full support. The year 2018 is a year of big promises for the enlargement agenda and hopefully also groundbreaking events. Our debate this morning could therefore not be planned at a more timely moment. Just 10 days ago, the European Commission presented the, the enlargement strategy. It is hoped that uh, with strong messages emerging from the strategy paper and the upcoming enlargement package in April, the EU Western Balkan Summit scheduled for 17th of May in Sofia could mark a further step forward in our enlargement agenda, concrete step forward. There is a sense of urgency to have enlargement high on the agenda of the European uh, Union. And I hope that this message is being heard loud and clear and that our partners in the region realize the momentum that 2018 creates. In my daily work in the European Parliament, I'm engaged in each and every one country from the region. And in this respect, if you allow, I would like to make three general remarks rather than speaking about each country individually, separately. First of all, the conditions and criteria for accession are straightforward. As we will celebrate 25 years of Copenhagen criteria adoption at the European Council in Denmark back in 1993, I would like to remind everyone that this is not a relic of the past or a historical memory from the EU integration process. The Copenhagen criteria are the very fabric of our common project and they are valid as ever. 
I am saying it because when we are discussing these issues in the European Parliament, sometimes Copenhagen criteria are forgotten, and we, I think, need to remind the countries going through accession negotiation that they are still there and they are really very important basis. They define who and under which circumstances can join the European Union. They are essential parts of the accession process, and I would like to take the opportunity to quote the first Copenhagen criteria, which is still very important. I quote, stability of the institution guaranteeing democracy, the rule of law, human rights, and respect for the protection of minorities. You will find everything there. This is translated also through the importance of the chapter 23 and 24 in the accession negotiations. They require constant work and engagement on many levels, especially those which are in the core of the EU, functioning democratic institutions and judiciary, rule of law, civil liberties, and respect for the fundamental freedoms. I'm repeating what Madam Minister said in her introductory remarks as well. Second, we need also to be clear about resolution of bilateral issues. They hamper the negotiation in the region and slow down regional cooperation. EU, I think, should proactively work on their solution and find the mechanisms which would allow to solve them. This should complement the genuine efforts of the countries in the region themselves, of course. This is unfortunately still not entirely the case, and we see consequences and growing tensions in many, many parts of the region. With goodwill in bilateral relations, we will also see an improved and honest regional cooperation. This is key for the future functioning of the enlarged union. And third one, a proper functioning parliamentary democracy needs to be at the core of any future EU member state. I believe that both the European Parliament and my colleagues, the members of the European Parliament, are well placed to stress this message across the entire Western Balkan region. In the past years, we were working, working hard in engaging with our partners. Some concrete examples are the ones from Albania and Macedonia. I honestly hope that the era of parliamentary boycotts will be a thing of the past and that national parliament inside their walls, not outside, will be the place where political battles will take place. In, will take place. in this respect, there is still work to be done in the respective parliaments in the region. And I hope that the next couple of months will bring progress also in this domain. Before we start our debates, I would like to reiterate the words of David McAllister. David, you are already a classic. You are being quo quoted. Uh, uh, you know it's dangerous, please. <laughs> Mr. McAllister mentioned the following in his op opening speech yesterday. We must more firmly embed the Western Balkans into the fabric of the EU processes and structures, be it through cooperation with EU agencies, participation in the EU policies, and programs of the involvement into the EU CSDP missions and operation. Well said, David, and I think that we should follow this word. Uh, about the, about the date, 2025. I think that uh, this could be a very lively discussion if we start it. Uh, Madam High Representative mentioned yesterday that it's an, it's an indicative date. And I think that uh, instead of concentrating on the discussion on the date, we should concentrate on the reforms and the, all the necessary things which should lead our partners to the, to the European Union. I know our partners in the region, and frankly, in order to make discussion more lively, I really don't know whether this is going to encourage them or discourage them. It will be very, very individual, and I think that uh, if somebody thinks that 
at 2025, they will accede to the European Union automatically. He's wrong, and we should tell, we should tell it. Maybe Thomas will explain it in, in, in more detail. So I really, I take these dates as a, as a kind of orientation date, not obligatory date for the taking new family members to the European Union. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. I still reserve the right to come back to you on the second issue of how we persuade the European public that this is something good. Uh, but maybe we can do this in the first round of Q&A. Um, Mr. Mayer-Harting, the task of the external action service in a way to a big uh, extent was accomplished, right? The strategy is out there. Uh, member states uh, are discussing it, and the countries in the region um, are making their conclusions. What is uh, what was maybe what was your ex expectation from the strategy, and and is is ha has your expectation been met so far from the debate as far as you can follow it? Well, uh, Madam Chair. Um Madam Minister, um, honorable members of parliament, uh, uh, ladies uh, and gentlemen, it's a privilege to be here and uh, it's always good uh, to be at the right place at the right time, if I may say so, uh, to start with. Obviously, it's the right time because the strategy is an important uh, element on our path, on the European path of the Western Balkans. And obviously, as has already been made clear by what Mr. Kukan has said, we have a considerable way still ahead of us on which we all need to work, uh, including the external action service, obviously. And secondly, um, it's the right place uh, to be in uh, because the Bulgarian presidency and Bulgaria is one of the countries of the European Union most committed uh, to this European perspective. And as has already been said, uh, it is the first of a succession of presidencies which will hopefully uh, promote this agenda, followed by the Austrian presidency and the Romanian presidency and others to come. I won't speculate on the, on the aspects of the data. I understand this has already been a discussion yesterday. This was discussed by foreign ministers at the Gimnich meeting. The high representative has expressed her opinion on the subject. It's obvious that this is not a firm target date. The 2025 opens a perspective uh, and, uh, the, um, and the strategy as such mentions a number of indicative steps which need to be met uh, to make this, uh, this perspective come true. Uh, the strategy itself even speaks of best case uh, scenarios, but obviously everybody has the possibility uh, to prove uh, us and the strategy wrong in this point. I would also say that um, the term front runners uh, is perhaps misleading, uh, as the high representative has said repeatedly, at the present state uh, of play, if you, if you consider running as negotiating, only two of the Western Balkans partners are running. So uh, they're, they're not front runners, they're running. And clearly the uh, perspective of the strategy is uh, to make everyone uh, move forward on the European path and that is also very important. The strategy as such has a message uh, for everyone. This, to be honest, was not obvious when we worked on the strategy. It, was an, it caused quite a lot uh, of work and uh, engagement, in particular for the High Representative, for Commissioner Hahn and others, to make this strategy a strategy addressed to the entire region. And as you have seen, the strategy mentions next steps, possible steps for every single Western Balkans partner. Uh, the next point uh, I would mention is that if you speak about what we need to do and what we want to do, it is clear that the European Union wants to be strengthened by this uh, enlargement process. And this is why it was also linked to 2025, which is a target date for our internal reform process, as parliamentarians know. We do not want to uh, import problems. We want to become stronger. And therefore, one of the very clear messages of the strategy also is that the partners in the region need to solve their own problems, need to solve, uh, need to build good neighborly relations, need to build strong relations with each other, need to reconcile where necessary so that we don't import problems but become stronger. 
In this context, Bulgaria again uh, is the right place to be. Uh, uh, Bulgaria and your neighbors in Skopje concluded already an important agreement uh, on reconciliation, which is a model for other agreements of this kind that will hopefully follow. Yesterday, we saw the uh, presidents of Kosovo and of Montenegro make an important step forward on border demarcation. All of this is positive. And I would also say a word in this context on the dialogue uh, between uh, Belgrade and Pristina, a process that is facilitated uh, by the high representative. If you look at the strategy on that point, the strategy is also extremely clear. What we are looking for is a comprehensive, legally binding agreement reflecting full normalization of uh, uh, relations between Belgrade and Pristina. And I repeat, this needs to be implemented. And it is very clear in the strategy that this is a precondition for both partners uh, to move forward on their respective European paths. Belgrade, uh, Serbia uh, cannot join the European Union without this uh, precondition being met and uh, Kosovo can also not move forward on its European path without this uh, condition being met. Which basically means that if these conditions are met, we, are also, we will also experience what is, I would consider, a fundamental transformation of the entire political landscape uh, in the Western Balkans, which will obviously uh, change the outlook for everyone in the region. The other point is because you also asked about uh, the, our own public. The, strategy uh, is not only addressed to the Western Balkans, it's addressed in a very clear way also, uh, obviously, to the honorable parliamentarians around the table, but also to the public in our own member states. Some uh, uh, partner, uh, partners in the Western Balkans have found that the language we have on the rule of law is perhaps a little harsh. It's very firm, I have to say. It is very clear that at this point of time, especially when it comes to the rule of law, none of the candidates uh, meets the, and none of the partners in the region meets the requirements uh, defined in Copenhagen that uh, Mr. Kukan, Minister Kukan uh, explained so clearly. It speaks about widespread corruption. It even speaks about state capture uh, in the language of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, strategy. And this is harsh language, but this is also addressed to our own publics. It is clear that we don't want to import uh, problems of these kinds. The support of, uh, to the region in, with regard to the rule of law, which is a key area, and I'll come to that in a second, of what we can offer and what we need to do is done in their interest and in our own interest. And uh, this, uh, uh, this also uh, brings me finally uh, to the area of what we can do uh, to promote these processes. We have defined flagship areas and flagship initiatives in which we, the External Action Service, the European Commission, member states will need uh, to work uh, in the uh, months and years ahead of it. And these include in particular the strengthening of the rule of law, uh, security and migration, and migration is in fact an area where the uh, European Union, its member states, and the region have already cooperated successfully in the past, and Bulgaria knows this better uh, than many others. It's about social economic development, it's about transport and energy connectivity, a subject that the minister just mentioned, it's about the digital agenda, and it's about supporting reconciliation and good neighborly relations, and the strategy has more than 50 concrete areas and projects where this can be done and this should be done. And I, I would like to point out that, uh, uh, that we will have a very important event forthcoming once again uh, in Sofia in the months to come, in May, when uh, Bulgaria will host uh, the Western uh, Balkans Summit. Uh, n very noteworthy event, the first summit of its kind since Thessaloniki uh, in 2003. It is a very important event. It is not, in our uh, understanding, uh, an event that is as such uh, about enlargement, but obviously we would hope uh, for the summit to reconfirm the commitment that the European Union and its member states uh, took in Thessaloniki already in 2003, but it is precisely about moving forward the regional agenda and I think that there will be a strong overlap 
between some of these flagship areas that we mentioned, in particular also in the field of connectivity, in particular on security, uh, in particular on reconciliation. And I think that in this sense uh, this, uh, the, that, the, that the SOFIA summit will help us also move forward in a process that is beneficial uh, to the European Union and that is beneficial to partner countries. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This was uh, very concrete uh, and uh, to the point. Um, I think there are several group, uh, groups of issues that uh, came out of, uh, of the three statesmen that we heard. Uh, uh, this, uh, the first group was uh, the reforms in the field of rule of law, and uh, I would add Copenhagen criteria is something that uh, uh, we should re indeed not forget it's about the quality of democracy going slightly wider than uh, simply rule of law and institutions. Because quality of democracy, I think, means also freedom of media, the way NGOs are treated, um, and we know that in some of the countries it has been problematic in the past. Uh, the second big group of issues is the bilateral disputes. Um, and everything that um, has to do with the past, the very rich past of this region. Um, and I think the third um, group of, of issues is everything that has to do with the uh, social and economic life of the citizens and how uh, we, make, we work on, on uh, issues uh, like uh, uh, youth unemployment, but also uh, the need for investment, uh, connectivity, digital inclusiveness, and so on. Um, I think all those um, uh, three groups uh, of issues are uh, big um, challenges uh, for the region, but also uh, where the EU can really uh, still play a leading role. Maybe just to note that, however, we are not the only ones um, in this uh, um, present in these areas. Uh, China is going to be the number one investment investor in Serbia in this year. And uh, those of us who have been working on the Balkans for the past decades remember that 15 years ago China was not um, mentioned in any way uh, in this region. And I'm not going to go uh, further into the discussion about the third actors in the Western Balkans, but basically this is something that also should keep us alert and, uh, and focused. With that, I am going to open the floor to your comments, uh, questions. Of, uh, of requests for... Uh, for questions? Can you can you please introduce yourself, sorry? Danke sehr, Frau Vorsitzende. My name is the Bösch. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, uh, Mr. Bösch, I'm the head of the Austrian delegation. In the context of the Western Balkan states, I would like to ask our experts a question. Next to this institutional development, which is important in terms of rule of law and all the elements you mentioned, what about the development of the security situation? Um, how is that seen from the European perspective, also from the Bulgarian perspective? You know that Austria has uh, military forces in Bosnia and also in the Kosovo. So this question is an important one for us. How, in your view, will the security situation develop in the Western Balkan region? Thank you. I suggest we maybe collect two or three questions. Uh, Mr. Obradovic from Serbia. Thank you. Distinguished colleagues, I would like to say something in the name of Serbia as the head of the delegation. Serbia hails the European Commission strategy for the Western Balkans and the full membership perspective offered to Serbia and other 
Western Balkan state by this document. I would like to extend thanks to our Bulgarian neighbors for putting the topic of the European Union enlargement to the Western Balkans among the priorities of their presidency. The Republic of Serbia aims to fully harmonize its national legislation with the European legislation until 2021st in order to fulfill conditions for membership. Serbia is very much aware of the greatest problem in the European integration process, and that is resolving the Kosovo and Metohia issues. We have demonstrated our sincere intention to address this issue by signing the Brussels Agreement and maintaining the belgrade pristina dialogue. Our intention to solve this issue is also expressed by development of the internal dialogue of Kosovo and Metohia. Unfortunately, provisional institution and Pristina do not demonstrate readiness for resolving the problems that exist more than 18 years. Return of refugees and internally displayed person, usurpation of property, harassment of citizens, solving cases of killing killed Serbs and missing persons, etc. Not a single one of these issues was resolved since it is not in favor of the so-called Kosovo independence. Pristina does not implement the Brussels Agreement, although this agreement is a part of, of the common foreign and security policy of, of the European Union, on behalf of which the High represent, Representative for Foreign and Security Policy took part in drafting and signing it. The tragic event of Oliver Ivanovich's murder show how poor the situation in general in Kosovo is. By visiting Kosovo and Metohia, the President of Serbia has demonstrated the desire to calm down the situation and help the citizen. However, in order to continue the dialogue, Pristina needs to make concrete steps in resolving Oliver Ivanovich's murder and other outstanding issues. Her Serbia has no dilemma that it will meet all membership criteria, but it is important for the enlargement policy to be clear, transparent, and not apply a double standard. I sincerely hope this meeting will be one more step towards meeting this goal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Obradovic. Minister Zaoralik. Ah, thank you very much. Thank you for convening this gathering and uh, uh, allow me first of all maybe to say that I'm very glad that now in this papers, we can read that the enlargement policy is one of the most successful policies of the European Union. I'm, I'm very glad that uh, something similar was said also from Mr. Juncker in September, uh, September 2017 year in the Union address of President of the Commission when declared, Mr. Juncker also declared that uh, and signaled a renewed openness uh, toward EU, EU enlargement uh, in, his, uh, in this uh, State of Union speech. All these things are very positive and very important for us on both sides. And I am also I'm very pleased that Bulgaria has made the Western Balkans a priority as the current holder of the EU's rotating presidency. And I, I'm very glad that Sofia will host uh, also this summit of EU and Western Balkan leaders in May. All these things are really very important and, and fundamental. On the other hand, I'm, I, I'm, I'm sure also that uh, putting the Western Balkans so high on the EU agenda carries the risk, because uh, we are raising some expectations, and it's very important also to be able to deliver something concrete and, that, and to show that we are able to reali realize and answer these hopes, these hopes. And uh, uh, when speaking about risk, risk, it seems to me that it's something which seems to me very, very serious and very important, because we are living in a very turbulent world. Geopolitics is back, as it was said many times. I am convinced that uh, for current state, the European Union is very important, our ability also to create common foreign and security policy. And if we are look for partners and future members of the EU, it seems to me very important to see that uh, these partners are able and willing 
to align, uh, to align with the EU common foreign and security policy. Federica yesterday said that maybe this uh, word alignment is, is too passive. Um, I, I agree absolutely that this point is, is really very important. And uh, there are expectations on both sides. And uh, I'm also convinced that uh, this ability to align with uh, EU common foreign and security policy is fundamental prerequisite and precondition for this whole negotiation process. And I, I can imagine that to solve this problem, we have to develop individual approach to, 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 to these countries, but we should speak also what we should do with countries which are not willing and not willing to accept and uh, not willing to accept this uh, prerequisite and these conditions for, for this enlargement. And I'm, I'm speaking about it because it seems to me it's very serious. In current world, this ability to be, to participate on common foreign and security policy should be something like uh, point of division and uh, important point for our decision making. And uh, to speak about it frankly and clearly, it's probably also prerequisite not to, uh, not to, to, to be prepared. Maybe if, if we want to deliver, if we want to show that we are able to deliver and not to create disappointment, it's also the must to speak openly about this thing. There are conditions which has to be fulfilled for any country which has interest to be part and to start this process of negotiations. Allow me to stress this special point. Maybe in these days, very important and fundamental. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Indeed, the CFSP alignment has been uh, reiterated um, as a necessary prerequisite for a real partnership. Um, I was advised that uh, due to the late uh, appearance of the list, Ms. Jelia Nazovko, who was first on that list, has been omitted, so I would like to call on her now. Oh, she's not here, okay. Um, then uh, we go to Mr. Kaštiunas. Uh, good, okay, good morning. Uh, first of all, I uh, uh, would like to say thank you very much for all the organization and also uh, absolutely agree with a colleague from uh, Czech Republic. I even go, I will go a little bit deeper. Of course, Lithuania supports the EU open doors policy and uh, the European perspectives for all Western Balkan countries, also as for EEP countries. But uh, we see some very worrying trends, especially in Western Balkans, and I will call it a dilemma of sitting on the two chairs. And for example, Serbia. Uh, country which level of alignment with EU common foreign and security policy is only 48% in 2017. Country hasn't joined the EU sanctions on Russia. It started even negotiations with Eurasian Union on free trade agreement. Uh, as we all know, that joining the EU is a choice. That's why Lithuania fully agree with the Commission that the EU enlargement is far more than a technical calendar-based process and requires sharing the principles, values and goals of the EU, including full alignment with the common foreign and security policy, including restrict restrictive measures. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. I suggest we also take Mr. Nikolic from Montenegro and then we come back to the panel. Dear ladies and gentlemen, our distinguished Bulgarian hosts, in the context of the reforms in the overall perspective of the Western Balkans, I would like to say that we see the new strategy of the EU enlargement as a strong promotion of the Euro integration idea with a permanent goal that we all make it more credible and modern. We in Montenegro think that the new energy of the enlargement policy is the key to the solution of the long-term sustainability of the European unity, but also for the upgrading of the enthusiasm when it comes to integration of the Western Balkan countries. Montenegrin membership in EU until 2025 
uh, as it is planned within the strategy, is an ambitious but plan that can be carried out. We are especially happy because of the fact that the European Commission clearly stated in the strategy that they will keep the principle of an individual rewarding candidate countries, which is one of great value for us and is one of the main preconditions of its further development. I want to assure you that Montenegro will successfully overcome every obstacle uh, on the European path and that we will fulfill all commitments even sooner than 2025 with the help of our European partners. That is our state priority. Thank you very much. I think there were a couple of important points. Uh, maybe we should go back uh, in, um, uh, to the panel now. Mr. Kukan, do you want to go first? Um, there was a question about alignment, uh, CFSP alignment, but I think also the general, the more general question about uh, how do we see the Western Balkans and how can we really convince our publics that the effort is <coughs> worth. Uh, thank you very much for the floor. Yes, to uh, convince the public of the members in the member states of the European Union that enlargement is in our really it's, go, it's going to strengthen the European Union is a very difficult question, no, no, no doubts about it. And I think that we need both uh, candidate countries and negotiation countries to help us, but we also have to do our own work. I remember when uh, Slovakia was among the 10 uh, countries, big bank, big bank enlargement, we had a division of labor. Our friends from Western European member states had also taken the obligation to positively inform their public about the uh, constructive contribution of the new member, no, new, new member state uh, by, by coming up with the example that it will be cultural enrichment and economic enrichment and so on and so forth. I don't know whether we are in that situation now, but my answer to that question will be that our friends from the Western Balkans should give us concrete examples uh, in a very responsible behavior in the case of, I don't know, illegal immigration from their countries, they should do all necessary things because this is a very sensitive issue. Let's not hide it in, in countries in France, Germany, whatever. And uh, uh, this can uh, spoil the mood. This can spoil the situation in, in those countries. And uh, we have to appeal to our colleagues that they should behave responsibly and help us to explain to our people that it will be, it will be not only problems what they are uh, contribu contributing to. And again, I would like to say that we also should be ready for this enlargement. We also should be ready for the accession of the new countries. We can also uh, mention the problems with the migration uh, during that time, Western Balkans countries showed that they can behave responsibly, that they can positively contribute, be it Bulgaria, Serbia, Macedonia. They showed that they can be a part of the common European answer to, to this issue. Concerning the alignment, of course, it's, it's, very, it's very important and it's worth mentioning that uh, Albania and Macedonia have 100% alignment and the alignment of another country, it was mentioned by our colleague from Lithuania. We are discussing this very intensively with our partners when the EU delegations are going to to those countries, we always are assured that the priority of Serbia is European Union. 
But uh, you, 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 you are right when you mention that you cannot be the best friend with Russia and best friend with the European Union. You have to clear your priority, state your priority very clearly, very convincingly, and behave accordingly. And I think that that will be the issue where we have to be more, more active in the future. And one last sentence. We should also behave responsibly. Sorry to say, when we ask our partners to fulfill something, and when they do it, we say, OK, but we need more. That's not responsible from us. When they deliver, we should deliver as well. Otherwise, we are going to lose credibility. And that we should also materialize and realize when we are going through this process. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vestava. I cannot be more agree with what you, you just said, uh, Mr. Kukan. Uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, all the Balkans countries should choose one best friend, and this best friend, uh, it's, uh, it should be European Union, if they will to join the European Union and countries from the European Union. Uh, we discussed, and I'm happy, uh, Mr. Kukan, that the, uh, the 2025 date was not the main, actually. Uh, uh, focusing uh, during uh, our debates in the uh, Foreign Minister uh, Council. Uh, we discussed much more the reforms, uh, uh, the, the substance <coughs> of the strategy, and uh, 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 what, is, uh, what we can do, we're absolutely right, that we should be ready and we should uh, have absolutely clear condition, conditionalities, the uh, Copenhagen criteria, uh, and I think that uh, these conditions uh, are uh, clear for everybody, and uh, we should uh, non-stop uh, make clear that there will be no uh, uh, changing in this criteria and no matter that, for example, prepare, uh, let's imagine that it's 2025, we we'll forget about this and uh, immediately one of the country will become a European uh, member. So I think it's clear for everybody uh, and um, the, uh, uh, the solving the problems with the neighbors, actually, it's something that uh, it's also mentioned in the Copenhagen criteria, and it's not new, because some of the colleagues yesterday from the Western Balkans country raised this question. Why we see something new in the strategy that was announced on 6th of February? It's not, not new. Uh, good neighborly relationship, uh, it's, uh, uh, as you read uh, in your speech, it's mentioned in the Copenhagen criteria. And uh, mm, I think uh, it is a positive for the, 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 the countries. I will give you the data after we sign the agreement with, uh, uh, with Skopje. Since 1st of August until end of the year, there is increasing of 11% of, of our bilateral trade. 11% increasing. So 10% uh, more uh, Bulgarians visiting uh, 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 Firem, and uh, um, um, uh, da, uh, our, uh, the interest of our business doubled. So this is uh, uh, this is a really uh, uh, this is a really uh, something that is remarkable. So this is a good sign that if we uh, uh, the, the, the Balkans countries many to solve the problems. Uh, uh, with the neighbors, uh, there is a win-win situation for everybody, for the two countries. This is really remarkable. I didn't expect this, uh, uh, this data, to be frank. Uh, and um, uh, what uh, uh, it, the question was raised, uh, uh, and it's really important. Uh, 70, we are the first European Union uh, and European member states, we are the, the first, still the biggest trade partner for the Balkans countries. But if you uh, and this is something that we should do, as you mentioned. It's our job also to show to the citizens the, uh, on the Balkans country, but, but also to, to ours, that this is a win-win situation, uh, how we can uh, manage this, uh, tackle this problem with the 53% of, uh, of, uh, of European citizens don't want uh, any further enlargement. Uh, and uh, create finally this uh, a strategic task force uh, uh, for the Western Balkans and uh, find resources for this because if we are the biggest uh, trade partner but if uh, you see the pools in some of the, Bal uh, the Balkans countries they consider as first 
trade partner and investor uh, Russia, third China, and this is in Serbia, and we are on the uh, second uh, China, and we are in the third place. Uh, so uh, we uh, uh, give we should give more uh, details and also help the uh, the leaderships uh, and uh, uh, and those country to um, present what European Union is doing for their citizens and uh, also why we should do our job why it's important to uh, uh, join this country to the democratic family for our citizens. And I am absolutely fully agree that they should deliver deep reforms and help us to help them. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mahatik, uh, I would also ask you to answer the question of uh, the Austrian colleagues from the beginning about the security situation in, in, Bos in Bosnia and Kosovo. Well, first of all, let me uh, start with cooperation in the field of foreign and security policy. I spent uh, four years as the ambassador of the European Union in New York, and basically what you do there is try to get uh, the European Union and its member states to speak with one voice. And I can tell you, and the foreign minister knows more about it than I do, that it is not even easy always uh, amongst the 28 right now. Uh, and it's hard work uh, to speak with one voice. But the general principle uh, that uh, we made is that we want to become stronger uh, uh, through enlargement and not increase problems that we have. So obviously uh, it is a priority for us uh, that uh, cooperation and alignment in the field of foreign and security policy uh, remains, uh, foreign and security policy remains uh, an important criterion uh, for uh, enlargement to the European Union. And I think I can only underline what was said in this context. Obviously every new member enriches the European Union through the regional and historical context it has. This has happened in every single enlargement to the north, to the Balkans, to Central Europe, depending on who uh, joined. But the essential point that at the end we have to be stronger uh, than before and be able to speak with one voice. The second point I wanted to make is precisely on security. Obviously, we have security concerns in the Western Balkans, with the Western Balkans and security concerns that we need to solve together. And they are spelt out in the strategy as well. It's about hybrid threats that we are facing. It is about radicalization. It is about extremism, foreign fighters, which have become a problem uh, in some parts of the region. Uh, and all of this uh, requires cooperation. And in fact, um, we are looking at possibilities uh, to strengthen cooperation with the region. And again, I think that the, uh, that the uh, summit in Sofia uh, will hopefully also provide some answers to what we can do more in the region precisely on these subjects as well. We have presences that the uh, uh, Honorable Parliamentarian from Austria, Mr. Berg, referred to uh, in the region, but obviously these are the result of the heritage of the past, and we want the region uh, to move forward in a manner that at one point makes these presences unnecessary, because obviously the real purpose uh, of integration is to extend the, uh, the region of uh, peace and, and stability in the, uh, in, the, in, in the whole of Europe, to make the Western Balkans a full part of the uh, European Union, to make also Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, progress uh, in the, in the years and months to come, and obviously uh, this uh, requires a, a shared effort, but it requires an effort, of course, from the, the, the partners in the region, because again, we don't want to import problems, we want to become stronger. And finally, um, perhaps um, one point, there is a strong message within the strategy also about the things the European Union needs to do to be prepared uh, for enlargement. It's about institutional reforms, it's about financial uh, um, decisions that need to be taken. And I understand that there was some criticism when the strategy was discussed, that these are matters that shouldn't really be part of the strategy, but that they should be discussed internally with the European Union as well. I think our point is that once the European Union becomes really serious about enlargement, it starts speaking about it, what, need, what it needs to do itself to be prepared for enlargement. So having language in the strategy on what we need to do budget-wise and institutionally is perhaps the strongest message in the strategy altogether that we're taking this perspective seriously. 
Very good, thank you very much. Uh, maybe we can also go slightly deeper into that issue in the, ne in the next round. What is uh, that the EU is planning vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis the next uh, multi-annual financial framework? Um, but I would now go back to uh, the questions. Mr. Shenach, that was, uh, that was the question that you wanted to ask, uh, or is it? I only want to first, as Austrian, say thank you to the Bulgarian presidency, because it's very important after so long break that the lights goes up on back in, 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 uh, in the Balkan region. And also that the EU initiative now gives a hope to the Balkan region. Because, but there is a lot to do. For example, Bosnia. Uh, we are still on the Tatan Agreement. This is not a, a constitution. And, uh, and there are a lot of problems with that. And the ignorance of the, 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 the judgment of the Human Rights Courts of Strasbourg uh, is unacceptable. Also, uh, Macedonia, the Ohrid Agreement, uh, is uh, still waiting to be realized. And uh, it's, it, the Ohrid Agreement was a kind of, of uh, civil ceasefire. And um, I think uh, there are a lot of problems which have the regions uh, uh, solved by themselves, and, uh, and also between uh, Serbia and Kosovo. But the, the, the European side can, should be help not only to open the market, also give the, you, the young people a perspective because the youth unemployment, especially in, in Bosnia, uh, is a bi a really a big crisis. And when we only open the markets and not have a, uh, also a, a programs uh, to keep young people uh, back in the jobs, uh, that makes the situation uh, very uh, weak, and, uh, but we should now go really ahead because the House of Europe is only finished when the Balkan region is integrated in the European Union. Thank you very much. Also, in view of the uh, upcoming Austrian presidency, I think this was a very reassuring uh, message for the Balkans. Uh, Mr. Kovacev from the European Parliament. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Vesova, and I will be very short. I don't like to repeat what many of the colleagues already mentioned. Two points. First point is to call of all of, all of us uh, not to be uh, hypocrites. We need uh, indeed to do our homework in all of our member states uh, and to convince our citizens that uh, the enlargement is the right way to go. Instability in one piece of the geographic part of the continent will increase if this part uh, is uh, pers uh, without perspective to, to join the European Union. And from our side, uh, this is a call also to, to the European institutions. Uh, we need to do more on communication. In the age of uh, hybrid threats, what you, we said, of fake news, of uh, um, spreading this uh, uh, virus, I would say, of uh, manipulation and falsification, uh, we need to have a much stronger EU communication policy, what EU is doing for the citizens of the region and uh, uh, what we can um, uh, provide them as a, a short-term, mid-term and long-term uh, perspective. This is very important what uh, now uh, Minister Zakharyeva mentioned, uh, these concrete projects. They must be even more concrete and they must be translated to each of the citizens of this, of, uh, this uh, uh, countries of the region, uh, what they can expect from the European Union. To open our programs, even without full membership in the European Union, for young people, Erasmus, uh, uh, digital on the roaming issue, this is a disaster, the, the level of roaming charges at the moment in the, in the Western Balkan countries. So <clears throat> the, I uh, welcome the initiative of uh, Commissioner Gabriel in this uh, uh, respect and hope uh, we'll have a timeline, uh, timetable, how we can uh, go also on uh, this issue. Uh, and uh, the last one is in the European Parliament, uh, I can also confirm what Edward mentioned. We are uh, quite uh, convinced that uh, uh, this uh, strategy now of the Commission uh, need to be um, translated uh, to uh, and, and uh, communicated uh, very 
good not only to the political class of uh, uh, the, the countries, but to the citizens uh, of uh, uh, all these uh, uh, countries, our neighbors. I am happy that the Bulgarian presidency, then Austria and Romania uh, are on the same line on, on this uh, and uh, hope that we, ha we are brave enough uh, uh, against some populism and uh, some uh, um, manipulation of the opinions uh, of the citizens in our countries uh, to try to, uh, to speak uh, the truth. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Uh, I will use the opportunity to announce that uh, we at the European Council on Foreign Relations are organizing an event with the representatives of the civil society from the Western Balkans preceding the Western Balkans summit in mid-May in order to really talk to those societies and not only talk about them. Um, I will now give the floor to Mr. Kovac. After Mr. Kovacev, we have Mr. Kovac. Thank you. After Mr. Kovacev, Mr. Kovac, that's nice, yeah. Thank you so much, Blagodaria. Uh, first of all, I'd like to express uh, really our satisfaction with Bulgaria having organized uh, this conference in such a manner also with stressing the importance of the Western Balkans. My first thought concerns the situation globally. 100 years ago, Europe was at war. We had a war, the first world war. Today, we have peace in Europe. 1968, 50 years ago, we had an intervention of the Soviet Union in Czechoslovakia. 1988, so 30 years ago, we had still the, the Iron Curtain. So the situation today is much better. That's the first thought. My second thought concerns the Western Balkans. The Western Balkans countries are surrounded by EU member states, which is a good thing. And when we mention China, Russia, and all these countries, yes, it's true, they're present. But I can tell you that they're much more present in Western Europe. When you look at China investments, basically there is something which is really true in Italy, in the UK, and in other countries of the European continent. The problem with uh, these f uh, third countries being present in the Western Balkans is something which has to do with the fragility of the Western Balkans countries. And now we're coming to my third thought. So we have to make these countries more stable. And if we want these countries, and if these countries want to become members of the European family, so I stress the word family, they have to become functional states. Functional states with a market economy and being based upon the principle of the rule of law. Without these conditions, they will never become members of the European family. But as they are very much motivated, and we also motivate them to, be, to stay motivated, I am convinced that in the near future they will become members of the European family. And uh, to be uh, quite frank, it is natural that in particular Serbia and Montenegro um, have the biggest chances to become members of the European family in the next decade. It is natural because of them being the most functional states, the most functional countries in the Western Balkans. Croatia supports very much their becoming members of the European Union, but I will stress once again what we need is the rule of law. And the colleague from Aust Austria, Mr. Schenner, he mentioned Bosnia-Herzegovina. Bosnia-Herzegovina has a constitution. It has a constitution. The problem is not that it has not a constitution. The problem is that the constitution is not being implemented. There are more than 70 decisions made by the Constitutional Court of Bosnia-Herzegovina which have not yet been implemented. One of these decisions has to do with electoral law. <laughs> So we expect our friends in Bosnia and Herzegovina to implement their constitution, to implement the decisions of the Constitutional Court, in particular the decision concerning the electoral law, because otherwise, otherwise there may be a risk of not being able for them to form a government after the elections in October. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ms. dobravska Suica. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Chair. First of all, uh, I would like to thank the uh, Bulgarian Presidency for um, putting uh, enlargement uh, high on the agenda and uh, making it one of its priorities. <laughs> 
I can continue where my colleague from Croatia, Dr. Miro Kovac, um, ends. Uh, I'm fully convinced that uh, these uh, Western Balkans countries should be members of the Union, and I completely agree with our Austrian friend who said that our House of Europe won't be finished uh, be, uh, if we don't integrate all uh, Western Balkans countries uh, in the Union. But of course, Copenhagen criteria, as Mr. Kukan stressed this morning, are uh, first and utmost, and without them, uh, they cannot uh, reckon on the integration in the Union. So, but peace and stability is the most important issue, I think, of course standard of living and all the things you have been mentioning, the digital agenda, roaming, all these things which could help uh, to standard of living are very important. But uh, peace and stability is the most important issue in this region. And we have to take care about this. And uh, this is the reason why we have to uh, take into consideration all the threats which are happening uh, all over the region. Uh, uh, having in mind uh, what we passed as uh, Croatia, I'm talking now on behalf of European Parliament, but I'm still member of, um, <laughs> uh, I'm still coming from Croatia. We uh, know what uh, reforms mean, uh, what uh, Copenhagen criteria are, institutions have to uh, be functional, and that is very important. Regarding Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is uh, for us very important, being uh, having uh, more than 1,000 kilometers of border with uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, it's very important to take into consideration all the uh, into consideration all the rights of all three peoples and, of course, minorities. As mentioned here, Constitutional Court in Bosnia and Herzegovina have passed around 70 decisions which haven't been implemented. The key one is electoral law, which uh, should be changed, and this is uh, what will bring, uh, I think, uh, peace and, uh, and uh, cooperation among these three nations. So we have to take care about this, and this is the most important thing at the moment. So. Uh, once again, I would like to thank uh, Mr. Kukan for his, uh, for his uh, opening speech and for taking care about all these uh, six countries uh, for a long time and for his expertise, if I may say. So let us all be together. Let us look forward to uh, SOFIA summit and uh, try to help the region to be integrated. Thank you once again. Thank you. And now a, a Dutch representative. Uh... Thank you very much. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm uh, the first member of a Western European Parliament who asked a question this morning. And I'd like to state that the challenges and the opportunities both for the EU are huge. And the importance uh, of a strong EU for the current, current member state, um, member states are wide and large, and uh, therefore I have some questions to the contributors this morning, and therefore it's necessary that the internal support for the EU in the current member states grows. And besides that, uh, I heard uh, Mr. Kuchen in his contribution talk uh, about fully support from the EU, <clears throat> and he mentioned the EPP as well, for uh, the Balkan countries. And uh, although he mentioned uh, 2025 uh, more as an orientation, he mentioned it as a date. And I want to ask, uh, because I think we need to be very clear, what now is leading? Is the date leading or are the conditions leading? Mr. Juncker said at this period, uh, no enlargement. And why did he say that? And uh, what does that mean for the next period? And, let's be honest, Mrs. Chair, shouldn't we give false hope? And I want to make an example for that. For instance, Serbia. They strengthened their ties with Russia. And Russia offers Serbia to bolster its economic and military development. It now looks like a competition between the EU and Russia about who has the best offer. But I don't feel like a competition with Russia about that. And shouldn't we be, not be more honest to candidate member states that this is not the way to enter? Shouldn't we not be honest that member states is not naturally 
sure not in this period, and also not sure in 2025. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Van Helvert. I think this was a very uh, important contribution because uh, we should know that there are different types of responses to the issue of the Western Balkans uh, in our union. And I think we should be aware of that and we should be discussing those differences openly. Um, the next speaker is Mr. Szynkowski Vel from Poland. Thank you, Chair. First of all, I want to thank uh, the Bulgarian Presidency for hospitality and express my great respect on the compromise uh, work on the compromise version of conclusions and flexibility which allowed to adopt important proposals to the text. Uh, the 2017 State of the Union brought about a renewed momentum in the enlargement policy that should be translated into an ambitious and forward-looking West Balkan strat strategy. Bulgarian Presidency made European perspective and connectivity of the West Balkans one of its priorities, and Poland is a staunch supporter of this approach. We look forward to the EC recommendation to open accession talks with Albania and Macedonia still in 2018. In the Belgrade-Pristina dialogue, we need more ownership and accountability on both sides. We hope that the dialogue stopped after the murder of Oliver Ivanovich will resume soon. We agree with the strategy that fostering good neighborly relations and reconciliation is a crucial to ensure a lasting stability in the region. We are concerned about the growing influence of ex external actors, notably Russia, in the West Balkans, bringing instability to the region. To counter it, we need, first, a credible accession process, Second, a strong socio-economic development. Third, enhanced strategic communication in the region. CFSP alignment is an important issue for Poland. It is not only about numbers, it demonstrates the geopolitical choice of the candidate countries. EU NAT and NATO need to have a strong footprint in the West Balkans, including an oper operational one. Our withdrawal would leave a power vacuum immediately filled by external ac actors and violent extremism keen to undermine the pro-Western path. West ba Western Balkans can serve as a good testing ground for EU-NATO daily cooperation as both organizations are present in the region. We need more visible projects in support of our partner so that they see that EU-NATO cooperation works on the ground. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, also a very supportive uh, statement. Uh, we will now hear from uh, Ms. Corelli. I will ask the last two speakers, because we're slightly running over time, to keep the two-minute limit. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Bulgaria, for the hospitality. Well, uh, uh, I was not supposed to speak, but uh, listening to non-European language of uh, one of my colleagues pointing the finger to what the duties and the obligations of other countries are instead of giving positive sign, as Mr. Cook and rightly mentioned. Uh, and the positive sign means pushing the dialogue to another level. Let me tell you that the Albanian Prime Minister in 2014 paid a visit in Belgrade after 68 years means that things can happen. No matter the troubled waters are, we need to build bridges. As Paul Simon and Art Garfunkel mentioned in, a, in a, their famous song decades ago. So we Albanians choose years ago who is the only best friend of us? What about you? Thank you. Is Ms. Zofko in, in the room? Yes, please, the floor is yours. 
Thank you very much, and thank you for giving me floor. Sorry for being a, a, a bit late. And uh, I would just like to add to what uh, all my uh, other colleagues from European Parliament have said already, and Mrs. Mogherini yesterday, um, the issue of enlargement um, in West Western Balkan is not anymore the issue whether our public is accepting or not new member uh, states. I don't know how much are you aware of the facts that uh, there are other countries that are not making such a big conditionalities, such as China, Turkey, and uh, Russia. And Western Balkan is a peace and security issue for all of us. So um, as an uh, Albanian colleague rightly said, the uh, bridges are being built. There is a, this is a question of peace and reconciliation. European Union has paid a big price in the 90s for not, uh, um, act, uh, for not acting as a first uh, as a, and ha not having a leading role in Western Balkan. So we should get out of our um, own little worlds and uh, start thinking big and the changing the narrative in the European Union because traveling around the world, Africa, Asia, and Latin America, European News Union is using uh, uh, its role, um, which is the moral and leading role as a, as a moral player. So this is the, the best chance to start at home. Western Balkans' uh, strategy of enlargement is not anymore a strategy uh, whether uh, we're gonna do the same thing like in last 15 years. Um, start making conditions, I think we should offer the hands and uh, uh, be a bit more open uh, towards these countries. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will come back to the panel. Unfortunately, Minister Zakharyeva had to leave, uh, but uh, uh, we, of course, have Mr. Kukan, who is going to maybe respond first. There were several uh, questions that you know very well. Um, the issue of the, um, of the statuses uh, and, and, and uh, the functionality of the, of the states uh, in the Western Balkans. Maybe uh, the Pristina Belgrade uh, dialogue, if you want to, to focus a little bit on that. But also the question that Andrei Kovacev raised about communication policy, how the EU can communicate itself better. Um, and, and I think also the issue of the false hope and to which extent we're being realistic. Shall I start with Mr. Mayakartik? Um, certainly. Um, first of all, uh, I just wanted to um, uh, link up with something that was said about the lower level of conditionalities that others are demanding who want to work uh, with the region. Obviously, uh, the ambition that we have is it's basically like marriage. It's a long-term, uh, uh, it's a long-term definite engagement, and this requires um, uh, this requires a commitment that goes far beyond uh, 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 short-term, short-term or even medium-term support. We are experiencing right now how complicated the uh, and painful divorce can be in such situations. And clearly, I mean, what we want to do, and I can only repeat myself, is have the. Uh, Europe, the Western Balkans partners as part of our family. They are part of our family and as has already been said, Europe and will only be complete uh, once they are uh, fully integrated. And I think that's a clear message which is very much uh, shared by us as well. Obviously, this requires a painful reforms, especially when it comes to the field of the rule of law, and that point has already been made. And I do have to say that uh, a member, uh, that, uh, that partner, uh, partners in the region have already made substantial reforms, and because a parliamentarian from Albania uh, spoke, what has been done there in the field of judicial reform and other areas is an important step in the right uh, direction. But I also would like to recall that the strategy says that at this point in time, none of the partners in the region fully meets the Copenhagen criteria. But obviously, the ambition is uh, to support your efforts to get there. And I won't revert uh, to the discussion of the nature of the date, 
basically it is not, as I've said earlier on, uh, a fixed target date. It opens up a perspective and the strategy uh, explains what needs to be done uh, to uh, realize this perspective, both by the European Union itself and by partners and the support that we can give on this way. And this support, by the way, also includes, and the strategy is relatively clear on that, uh, further support when it comes to our multiannual uh, financial assistance. Let me also say on the issue uh, between, uh, more specifically of the dialogue uh, of between Belgrade and Pristina, uh, because this is something that is facilitated by the High Representative. Important decisions and steps have been taken in this dialogue already in the past. Some of them, quite a considerable part, still need to be implemented. And it is good that uh, the, we will now, at the technical level, again have a meeting very soon, I understand, uh, in the very next days, that will work precisely on this implementation. But it may also be the case that these small scale steps by steps that we've been trying to do are not sufficient. And that therefore, to achieve real progress, what one needs is to fix the view to full and comprehensive normalization. And we are very appreciative of the fact that both presidents who are involved in this dialogue, uh, President Vucic and President Thaci, have committed to this goal of full and comprehensive normalization. And as I said earlier on, succeeding on this path, not only in words, having it legally binding and having this agreement uh, fully implemented is a precondition for progress of both Serbia and uh, Kosovo on their respective European paths. I think that uh, what we've heard here around the table is certainly encouraging for us. Uh, a lot of work still needs to be done uh, and I do think that the summit in Sofia will provide a good occasion to do an important part of this work. And I would also say, obviously, that communication uh, in the region, strategic communication is essential. There is a misapprehension in many places of what we are doing. It is not fully understood how, the Europe, how strongly the European Union, how forcefully the European Union is engaged, how central a partner it is for the region, and this is undoubtedly also an issue of communication. Thank you. Mr. Kukan, quick last words. I, I can be very short. Uh, listening to this lively and uh, good discussion, I would like to say one thing, that if all 28 member states of the European Union agree that enlargement of the Union is the right policy to move forward, if they are sincere, responsible to support this policy, I think that that, that is a precondition to continue the enlargement process successfully. <clears throat> and we should behave, accord behave accordingly. Many people said I fully agree. No discounts, no shortcuts for the new countries. We had to go the same way. Nobody gave us anything for free. So it's nothing wrong and they cannot complain that we are, we are strict. They have to fulfill everything to 100%, not necessarily more. 100% is enough. So we shouldn't come up with new and new requirements because we are shooting us to our, our, our leg. And uh, concerning, the, concerning the dialogue, yes, I fully agree, agree, agree there is no other way but continuing the dialogue to the full uh, normalization whatever it means, frankly, I don't know. Let, ho hopefully, when we get there, it will be, it will be more, cle more, more clear what does it mean for Kosovo and for Serbia and for us in the Union. And uh, here, it is very important to show the leadership in those negotiations, because let's speak openly, if we would leave them, just the two of them, it would not function at all. So it is our responsibility of the High Representative to go on because it's a very firm, very important part of the whole enlargement process. And if we manage to resolve this, then we are very good. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wonder why we did not mention actually one strategic overarching reason to have this discussion today. And this is the fact that it's in EU strategic interest to show that it can 
that it's not going to be shrinking from now on, it's going to be enlarging. And I think this is uh, also uh, the impetus that these efforts uh, should bring forward for our internal uh, European debate. With that, please allow me to thank this panel for their uh, great uh, contribution. Um, and I will, uh, I will invite you in, on behalf of the organizers to go out. There will be a family photo on the stairs uh, in front of uh, this hall. There will be also coffee. And uh, you can come back and continue at 11 o'clock with the next session. Thank you very much.